Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the business committee meeting to order at six o'clock. It's with great respect and humility. We acknowledge and honor the lands of the Sinemic people. The Sinemic people maintain their profound, unique and spiritual connection to the land through ageless traditions, teachings, stewardship and expressions of reciprocity. Are there any additions, deletions or changes in order to the agenda this evening? Hearing none, um, is there any opposition to approving the agenda as proposed? If you have opposition, please use the chat uh, box. And uh, hearing or seeing no opposition, the agenda is approved unanimous, unanimously. Can I get a motion to approve uh, the minutes of the September 16th uh, Business Committee agenda? It reads as follows, that the minutes of the Business Committee meeting held on September 16th, 2020 be approved. Do we have a mover? Uh, I see Trustee O'Neill moved the motion. I see Trustee Stanley in second. Is there anyone opposed to the motion? It looks like we're working through a little bit of technical difficulties here. OK, um, I don't see any opposition to approval of the September 16th minutes, so uh, the minutes are approved unanimously. Moving on to item number seven of the agenda. There are no presentations this evening. So we will move on to section eight, senior staff reports. 8.1, uh, we have a presentation by Secretary Treasurer Mark Walsh. And for your information, there's an information sheet on page eight of your agenda, and I'll pass it over to Secretary Treasurer Marsh. Well, sorry, Mark Walsh. <laughs> sorry, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to give some information this evening. So you'll see under 8.1, um, there's three uh, separate um, but related items. And so we thought the best way to present them would be um, as a package and kind of in an order of, uh, I think, uh, very interesting uh, to maybe less important during COVID back to very interesting. So. Um, I'm going to start on page uh, nine of the agenda, and that's the item that uh, Ms. Matthews has brought up here on the screen for us. And so this is the enrollment update, and there is a memo that outlines most of the changes, but we thought that would be a good idea to run through some, some of the really significant changes associated um, uh, with COVID. Uh, that that we've got as of September 30. And I just want to update everyone that this, um, there was a few minor shifts from the agenda that was originally provided on Friday um, to this agenda. And I'll just highlight where those changes are uh, in case you didn't get a chance to, to read the most up-to-date one. But overall, the message here is we're seeing that we've seen a, a significant decline or movement from our regular school. Uh, our bricks and mortar school over to dis distributed learning. So we're 807 FTE under what we budgeted. And if you'll recall, we actually budgeted in a conservative fashion as we do on a yearly basis. Uh, and so that's a, a major shift with a revenue implication of over $6 million. And so again, this is based off of two things. One, this is the move to DL, uh, either it's within our district and a few outside of district as well. And the other, the other thing that this represents is that a number of our secondary students at this point at least um, are looking at having lower FTEs um, than they normally would. So we normally have around for every head head in a secondary, we normally have uh, you know 97% of an FTE and we're we are lower than that in the 92 range or even perhaps a little bit lower i haven't got the number today so those are those are the two um, main nut drivers of the decline in bricks and mortar the other one of course our alternative uh this is just a little bit to do with the fact that we had fairly robust numbers to end last year and a little bit I, i'm assuming to do with covid so we don't have quite the intake that that we did 
Of course, distributed learning is seeing a very robust increase to 723 FTE, and that does drive some revenue, but nothing compared to what our loss is. Uh, homeschooling, you'll see we're, 60, we're at 91, apologies, up 63 from where we expected to be. You'll see, and just for your knowledge, um, if, if anyone says, well, we're homeschooling, we want our $250, the $250 that the district receives per homeschooling student is actually to fund the administration by the district of this paperwork here. And so it's not actually provided to, to the students or to the families. Uh, and then, of course, challenges are, are on the lower end. So let's we'll see overall on balance in, in our regular system of minus 145 FTE uh, to the tune of a loss of revenue of $2.1 million. Then in our special needs area, and this actually is a bit more optimistic and we're, we're happy because the numbers were shifting throughout um, last week as or the week before as we we're finalizing our numbers. So you'll see uh, decline um, largely level and level one special needs so are very high need students. Our level two special needs up significantly and then our level three special needs uh, down significantly. Uh, again, some of those level three moved up to level two. Some of the level three students um, had trouble, we understand, accessing some of the community supports that gets us across the line to get a designation. But <clears throat> again, because of the increased over budget in level two, uh, we're well positioned um, from a financial perspective on the special needs. And again, those numbers were fluctuating uh, right up till the end. So it's uh, good news there. So those are the highlights of the enrollment uh, part. And perhaps I could pause to see if there's any specific questions about uh, enrollment from from the committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walsh. Uh, our first question is from uh, Trustee Higginson. Thank you to the chair. Thanks for this. I think you explained it all, but we all know what happens when I see charts with numbers. I get confused. So um, I just want to make sure that I, I understood correctly is that uh, the 807 that we were under budget resulted in a six million dollar loss in revenue. However, there was also an increase in DL, so it settled out at a 2.1 million dollar loss in expected revenue. From the regular student enrollment operating grants, yes. Can I just have a follow up? You may. Thanks. Is that uh, 2.1 million just simply in the FTE and operating grant? numbers or is that that we're 2.1 million, million short after all the grants like and all the sort of the federal grant and the provincial special purpose grant for COVID? No and okay. that will be the third part of this presentation where all the expenditures are associated with COVID um, and so the this this doesn't include any additional funds that we would have received from the federal or provincial grants and it doesn't anticipate how any money that the ministry may later uh, divvy out to, to school districts um, impacts this. This is purely Here's the formula that we submit on September 30. Here's the funds that it drives, and here's the difference between budget and today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mal Mr. Walsh. I'm going to get your name right one of these times. I'm sorry. <laughs> Trustee Stanley, it's your turn. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, one quick question. I have a couple of quick questions, but um, one would be, I, I, I Maybe I missed this, but where are the transition students? So the students that are in the transition program, where are they identified in our enrollment numbers? The transition students currently would be in our standard regular school um, FTE because they are they are sitting with spots in schools. And so after November 6th, then they will ultimately be registering in DL or registering or, or coming back to the seat that they have available in their home school. And then at a later count there, that would impact uh, funding. OK, thank you. Did you have a follow up, Trustee Stanley? It's not a follow up. It's an entirely separate question. OK, well, since there's nobody else on the list, I'll let you go ahead. Um, I, and I'm kind of I'm trying to find it just because it's in my notes from reviewing the, the um, documents. But um, so I can't find the exact numbers, but I was trying to figure out um, that we have some students from last year that are not identified in these numbers and so we've lost students somewhere 
Um, do we have any information about whether they've gone to a different program or if they have just disappeared and, and we don't know that they're receiving, um, <clears throat> you know, they're enrolled in an education program? Yeah, so we do have reports that uh, show if they've transferred to, say, Vancouver or they've transferred to North Island distance or um, <clears throat> or those particular issues. Uh, Ms. Sutton, perhaps did you want to add to that? Uh, thank you to the chair. Um, Secretary Treasurer Walsh is correct. We, we have a list of of students overall, and, and that list is, is similar each year of students that shift out, but there's also a similar list of students that shift in. Um, there were um, a few more students this year that have uh, left to go to um, DL offered in other areas in the community. Um, however, whether we see them return to the system is yet to be determined. And did you have a follow up to that one now? Oh, okay, this is a separate question, so you may. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I did find my number um, and I'm not sure if it's right, but um, I'm wondering, I just I guess I'm, I'm I'm wanting to ask just to for perhaps my own peace of mind. I'm not sure, but of those students that have not transferred, um, does the ministry have some form of mechanism? Are we able to, you know, at least check in with them? to see how they're, you know, managing during the pandemic. Like I, I just want to, for among those that kind of have kind of fallen out of the system, you know, is there a safety mechanism for a check? Yeah, I think the superintendent um, we, is the best position to answer that question because I know the answer is the district has a mechanism, um, but perhaps Mr. Saywell. Yeah, we, we don't have a, a for students inside the district, through the chair, I'm sorry. Uh, for dis for students inside the district, we do have a mechanism um, uh, for non-attenders, and so there's a there's a school-based team that does that work, and uh, there's a district team that does that work as well. And uh, it's a requirement of teachers to uh, phone students who aren't attending um, the school, but students who have are not enrolled in our school district and I think that's your question. Um, we don't have a mechanism for following up past September. So we do try to engage them uh, through the months of September until the 1701 snapshot date. Um, and then we find out through um, that process that other that students in some cases are um, going to other school districts or North Island uh, distance education uh, school as a as an example. Thank you. OK, so I don't see any other questions in relation to this particular item. Um, I'll ask one more time before we move on. Are there any other trustees that have questions related to the enrollment update? Just type it in the box if you have any. OK, I don't see any. So Secretary Treasurer Walsh, if you want to proceed with the second part, please, the quarter one update. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this this document um, is our typical document that we would be providing to track uh, expend, expenditures on a on a quarterly basis. And so the board uh, important to keep in mind that we are a 12 month on a 12 month fiscal uh, schedule, but really we run a 10 month uh, operation in many ways. Uh, and so really when you look at a teacher salary, you should be looking at about one tenth of the expenditure uh, after Q1, a bit more for AO administrative officers because they are they are getting their salary through the summer. So uh, I, what I would say for Q1 is it's given COVID and the, the major changes that are going to appear in our amended annual budget when it does come, um, Q1 is not our is not the best indicator this year of, of how we're doing generally. However, I would say that when you do compare us year to year with respect to the major expenses, uh, we're right. We're right in line where we would hope to be with the respect to those expenditures. And so you'll see again, teachers, 10% represents one tenth of of the expenditures for the year. So we're right on track. Um, you, you'll note substitutes is significantly lower than previous years, but you also recall that we did have a late start because of the the extra essentially week 
uh, to get schools ready to go. So that represents there. So really, barring any questions, uh, this is just for information uh, sake for the trustees. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Uh, we do have a question from Trustee Barron and followed by uh, Ms. Wood. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through the Chair to our Secretary Treasurer Walsh, um, thank you for this information. I'm wondering if you can clarify one item that stood out to me there when I was looking at the um, comparator from this year to last year around the French programs. I just noticed that, and, and maybe this isn't a significant percentage difference, I, I just don't understand the difference between the years being um, that we used 31% this year versus 14 uh, in the 2019-2020 comparator. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Sorry, could you just point to, to the... Yeah, I hope uh, the pages are still aligning from yeah. when I took okay, this. Okay, sorry, I, I, see, I see where you're at. So this yeah, would be on okay, page 13, yes. Ms. Matthews. Oh, okay, it's on a different page there. My apologies. Um, perhaps I could turn the question over to Ms. Sutton. Certainly through the chair. Um, this actually, uh, Trustee Barron represents the amount at this time last year that we had received in funding for the French program. And specifically, it's just a timing thing. In 2019, the only funds that we had on hand was the deferred revenue from the prior year, whereas this year we have received funding um, earlier than anticipated. So it's showing up now, whereas last year it was received a bit later. So just, just a timing issue. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Um, did you have a follow up to your question, Trustee Barron? No, that does uh, clarify. Thank you very much. I apologize for, uh, I, I thought we were on that page and I got us mixed up there, but thanks for the information around that question. Thank you. So our next question comes from Ms. Wood. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is also from page 13 and it has to do with the classroom enhancement fund. Um, at a previous business committee meeting, when we were first discussing the classroom enhancement fund for this school year, uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh indicated that we would, uh, that the ministry was doing things a little bit differently this year and that the amount of CEF that we were going to be provided initially was a reduced amount. And so schools, in particular secondary schools, were staffed uh, less than they would normally have been. And I'm just wondering if that um, will be corrected at any point, if Secretary Treasurer Walsh is able to comment on that or knows when that might happen. Sure. So through through you, um, Mr. Chair. So in in fact, this this year is a good um, example of or why that we didn't actually expend the additional dollars. Uh, at this point, we're just going through or finalizing our CEF uh, submissions to the ministry, and because of the significant shifts in our secondaries, it's actually looking like there's actually less. Um, classroom enhancement fund dollars that we're actually eligible for based off of the numbers and the class size composition issues happening in secondary. Um, and so that number may actually not increase. We don't have our final um, uh, tally at hand um, and perhaps I can ask Ms. Sutton if she'd like to add to uh, my comments. Uh, thank you to the chair. Uh, no, Secretary Treasurer Walsh, you're, you're correct. It's looking at this time like secondary isn't going to change and still working through the numbers with regards to the elementary needs and what we will be eligible to um, claim with the ministry. And hopefully we submit that on Friday and uh, hopefully we'll hear back from them uh, within a couple of weeks as to whether they've approved that funding or not. And so perhaps, and, and I can just add as, as further background for, for the committee's sake, is that uh, the CEF allocation that we receive 
um, must be supported by the numbers uh, within the individual schools and, and we attach individual blocks or divisions to, to CEF supports. Uh, and so it, when we do make that submission that we do have to prove that every one of them is needed. So if you have, uh, again, if you, perhaps you have a, a student and, and I note that there's less, as many heads, but less FTE. So if you had a student with less FTE, theoretically they're in less classes now. Therefore, if perhaps the, the CEF support is not necessary uh, for them to support. Um, so that's the kind of basis of how this, the submission is done. I think we, when we budgeted, we said, yes, we've, we've made sure that we're going to be conservative with secondary because we need to make sure the whites of the eyes are are shown before we actually staff it. And and uh, in, at this point, it, it seems um, like prudent decision making. Thank you very much, Ms. Sutton and Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, Ms. Wood, did you have a follow up to your question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it's concerning to me that the school district has to submit their final numbers on Friday for uh, um, the CEF when the union has not had an opportunity to um, to review secondary staffing uh, and and um, follow up with best efforts. So that review is not going to happen now until next week. We haven't even seen the data. Should the so my question is: Should the union? Um, have concerns with secondary staffing and um, there's an indication that there needs to be more staffing put into place to meet best efforts. What would be the process if you'd already submitted your numbers on Friday? Through Mr. Chair, if I could ask uh, Ms. Sutton to respond. Through the chair, um, Thinking how best to, to, to word this, Ms. Wood. Um, so each year we are required to submit these numbers to the ministry and in a collaborative effort, this data is collected. Uh, I'm not uh, privy to the conversations that happen with the local, so I'm not sure if maybe um, Deputy Superintendent would be able to speak to what that might look like or not. I'm not even sure if he's available. Um, I submitted on behalf of the ministry or on behalf of the district, uh, but I believe there's conversations outside that I'm I'm unaware of. Perhaps, Mr. Chair, I can I can get back to uh, Ms. Wood and copy the committee as well. I believe that would be a great way to to handle the question. Is if you could do that, please, Secretary, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, so we'll move on to Trustee Bursevic. Thank you. Uh, just one of the things I've been wondering about is. I know that we have had to not have rentals uh, after school and in the evenings this year uh, because of COVID, which makes sense. And I totally I understand that. Have we had any conversations with those renters, particularly once we've had long term about whether when they're allowed to, they're going to want to come back or whether they found? I guess my concern is long term losses if people find other places to go to have to rent their to run their groups because there are other places in the community that are starting to do rentals. So have we had any of those kinds of conversations with any of our renters? Sure, Th through you Mr. Chair, perhaps I could ask Mr. Sabo to respond. Yes, thank you uh, through the chair. Um, our rentals department has been uh, working with rental groups and cancelling contracts as time goes on. Um, we are keeping in touch with them. We haven't had discussions with them as yet as to when we're going to uh, look at having rentals back in the schools. We have been working with strategic partners such as elections and, and um, others to ensure that they uh, continue to do their operations. And I think it's something that um, uh, as October rolls to a close, we should be addressing and considering um, how and when we might have rentals returned to the district. Okay, okay. if I could have a follow up, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Trustee Rosevic. Mr. Walsh, is there any ability to, do you think, to suggest to the ministry that, that these losses that we could include are we including these losses of, of money that we normally would get from rentals in our sort of COVID 
if not expenses, but consequences? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, indeed, indeed we are. With respect to whether there's funds available to make up for it, um, I'm not quite sure. We're definitely focused on the issues we've talked about in the past with respect to, you know, fund us at headcount, fund DL as the same as, um, as bricks and mortar, because the, the revenue loss for rentals is relatively minor compared to some of the other financial impacts. And yeah. we'll talk about that briefly um, with the federal funds. Um, so so they we do report though, we do report that number to the ministry about revenue losses, including uh, rentals. Thank you. Okay, so our next question comes from Trustee Stanley. Hi, thank you. In some ways, I'm, I'm going to transition to the third topic because I was actually going to wait um, for my question until we're all done, but Secretary Treasurer Walsh just touched on the issue that I want to um, understand a bit better, which is, um, you know, a little bit focused on the loss of funds because of the transition to DL, but, um, you know, a, a broader consideration as well in reading all these documents, I guess I'm not fully clear to the extent to which that we are not receiving sufficient funding to kind of, you know, for basic student education. So not necessarily like the rentals or anything like that, but more like, you know, we've lost uh, significant funds because of DL, but yet, you know, our staffing, um, we still have the same number of schools, we still have the same number of secretaries and um, other additional staffing. So the costs have not gone down correspondingly. Um, and so what my kind of overall question is, is um, that when we look at the, you know, again, those other funds and, and, you know, kind of the big picture of this, is there, are we at the point of needing to advocate to the ministry? I don't know. Um, I did get the indication that, that, that there were a number of conversations going on with the ministry and that perhaps this conversation isn't, hasn't, you know, come to its uh, end yet, but I, I did want to get an indication of <clears throat> at, uh, are we at the point that perhaps some advocacy is important with regards to kind of, you know, the, the realities of, of how students are transitioning and how that's affecting us financially. Sure. Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I can speak to um, the, what ministry has communicated to school districts is, is that many school districts are, if not all, are in very similar circumstance with respect to revenue loss. Uh, leave aside the rental issue, but like the, the drive to DL, less students in schools, et cetera. Um, which means though that the Ministry of Education is going to end up um, sitting on extra funds. So whatever they got in the budget from Treasury Board, they get, they don't have to return to Treasury Board. So in the years past when school districts were declining in enrollment, the ministry used to do a hold back. So they'd hold back some some funds and then later in the year when all the numbers shook out, they would then divvy out extra dollars to school districts uh, with that hold back. Um, we anticipate something along that lines coming this year. So they are sitting on dollars. We just haven't heard specifically what it is. We've heard the, com the communication and the commitment to make sure that they spend all of the money that they have. So that means that we anticipate more. We just don't know what it looks like yet. And so as we've spoken before, the big, the biggest, the biggest impacts for us would be if the, um, if the, the previous recommendations of the, funding review committee were implemented with respect to uh, funding for headcount rather than full-time equivalent and funding DL at the same as a bricks and mortar school, uh, we'd be in a very, very healthy position when you when you include the federal funds and the additional provincial funds. So we're quite confident the ministry will, will do something and we're hoping to hear very soon what that is, but we just don't know how the, the additional funds will be divvied out. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Uh, Trustee Stanley, did you have a follow up? I don't. I hear that as we still have some hope, so I'll stand by. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, seeing no further questions, um, the next item for Secretary Treasurer Walsh is the provincial and federal grants update. Sure, so starting on page 17. So just as a, as a good reminder, 
Uh, prior to the beginning of the school year, we did receive uh, a grant from the provincial government, <clears throat> which was part of their $45 million investment um, for starting schools safely. And so you'll see those numbers of what the, the money is supposed to be uh, spent on broken down there on page 17. Um, and so I can say very safely that those funds have been expended and more, and we'll go through that in just a moment. Then, of course, uh, the federal funding was was provided uh, and the basis of the expenditures, uh, appropriate expenditures there is at the bottom of page 17, so learning resources and supports, of $5.2 million. At this point, we've received uh, half of that and we anticipate receiving the balance uh, in January of 2021. So I think the probably the best page to, to start off with would be page 19, which I'm sure is not going to show up sideways. Oh, it does. Good. So <clears throat> this is the probably the quickest way to understand the, the impact, um, both of revenue loss as well as where the expenditures have gone, uh, as well as, a, to be clear, monies that the board has spent out of its operating surplus to be able to support COVID as well. So you'll see $5.2 million and one, approximately 1.1 for a total of 6.3 million. So here's here's the, the difference, of course. And so in, or DL uh, has got many additional FTE uh, for a cost of uh, approximately $2.2 million. Uh, transition program teachers, and so you'll recall these are the teachers doing the transition program until November 6th. So the prorated uh, amount that that cost is is 320,000. Um, surplus teachers, and so here's an example of where the board, um, when when the school year started, normally we would be collapsing, um, changing, rejigging schools. Uh, up until the second week, maybe even, hopefully not that long normally, but up to that. This year that didn't occur because of course we'd be mixing cohorts right off the bat. So we tried our best to avoid it. Um, if it was any other year, there would be 11 less divisions uh, in our elementary schools right now. And that's including the fact that we have a number of transition uh, students that are not even in class, but are part of class sizes. And so you can imagine for the first since October, um, you know, not not everywhere, certainly, but many, many schools with with fairly low uh, ratios of, of, of teachers to students. Then you also see additional support. Uh, obviously, uh, our international or not international, sorry, distance program uh, has turned into a full fledged school, essentially, not that it wasn't before, but it went from 200 odd students and 20 staff to far, far more than that, uh, and particularly with a robust K to nine program as well. So there's some additional support just to make sure that those DL teachers have the support they need for um, getting prepared to serve the students. <clears throat> and then finally, secondary teachers again, we wanted to make sure that we could build cohorts uh, that would support um, the kids. Ultimately, in some of these cases, we've overstaffed those schools because there's not enough kids in our secondaries to warrant that additional staffing, but collapsing um, collapsing those cohorts in the first two weeks was not something that we were going to do. You'll see the custodial, a, an enormous additional uh, cost associated with additional caretaker time, uh, some movement over the summer, including supplies and equipment, educational assistance, and some other support staff to support our DL students. Uh, new Nara supervisors, um, where we, you know, where we needed that uh, to make sure that we were able to to do proper social distancing. Uh, some, there was additional supports, again, uh, clerical support to support our DL program, which was getting in, uh, large numbers of registrations over the summer and into September. And then here's some numbers that haven't been expended, but just estimating what the costs of TTOC uh, time and casual time will be for us, in addition to what we've already budgeted. Uh, some minor things like ensuring that people had time to do uh, COVID safety orientations. And then finally, Woodlands. Um, Woodlands is a going concern for anyone that's been there. So we have a number of classrooms uh, that will support DL teachers for the foreseeable future and the transition teachers until November the 6th. Gabriola, we've had to, in order to allow uh, kids to actually get on, um, they're not allowed. There's a limit to the number of students that can sit in the waiting room in the Gabriola Ferry. So what we're doing is we're putting two buses on 
They go over in the morning to Gabriola on the ferry. Kids get on the buses as the waiting room, and then they come and they're bussed over to their respective schools on this side. Uh, PPE investments, uh, technology for Chromebooks, laptops, uh, tech licensing, you can see, and a number of other items um, that um, <clears throat> add up to a grand total of $7.2 million. So again, you, you'll notice some things. Maybe uh, we, we put some money aside in the operating fund for contingency. Uh, we put some money aside for um, you know PPE and for extra cleaning already in last year's budget. And so the 7.2, yes, it exceeds the money provided to address COVID, but the board is reasonably positioned to be able to support the difference. And then, of course, what's not counted necessarily is our is our transfer to DL and the revenue loss overall uh, and the homeschool loss, which is significant. Uh, as uh, Trustee Berzovitz was asking about our, our loss in revenue from facilities and leases and then our international student revenue, which was again covered by uh, the board in in the budget last year. So we're uh, not in panic mode, I think would be the way that we would describe it, uh, given the board's prudent budgeting. Um, and luckily we budgeted conservatively on on our enrollments. Uh, yes, we didn't make it, but um, we're not in a in a in a huge hole that we're not able to address this year. Now, if we don't see a end to COVID or we we see a continued move to DL, uh, we're going to have to be monitoring that very, very closely because there could be significant um, impacts on this district if if these shifts are permanent in nature, which um, we are certainly hopeful that they're not. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, I don't see any questions. Oh, there we go. We do have one. We have a question from Trustee Higginson. Thanks. I have a couple of questions, but I'll start with my first one, which is slightly random. But uh, I was and then I want to get back to our overall uh, budget uh, health conversation. But uh, I was hoping since we placed uh, a Gabriola bus run on for the purposes of COVID, that we would also see some uh, grant money or actually see it reflected somewhere in the increased cost due to COVID about safety issues at a Cole North Oyster, which has uh, incredible safety issues outside of COVID with the school and traffic and is exacerbated by COVID as a result of our requests and parents desire to not bust their students as much. Um, and and also the inability of parents to be on school grounds as much. So small kids are crossing the street where they can't see. It's just it's really bad anyway, and it's really bad now. Uh, is this accounted for anywhere that I don't see, or are we planning to address this as a COVID related cost? Through you, Madam. There, I got your name wrong. <laughs> through, through you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, so at this point, uh, we don't have a, a anticipated expense for a crossing guard at a Cole North Oyster. Um, I, uh, Mr. Sabo is prepared to speak about uh, the steps that have been taken with variety of stakeholders in the area with respect to safety. But on the immediate issue of uh, hiring a crossing guard, we don't have that in the federal funds at this point. Um, certainly, if the board went that direction, we'd find the funds to be able to support it, but we weren't anticipating that at this point as we continue to look at what the issue is and potential solutions. Can I just have a follow up on this? Uh, yes, go ahead, Trustee Higginson. Thanks. I, I appreciate that Mr. Sable is prepared to speak on a Cole North Oyster. I'm also aware that it's not on the agenda and that what we are talking about is the federal grants. And I, I, I'm OK with keeping the conversation focused on our overall financial health right now. Um, I just I was hoping to see something about North Oyster there, uh, but I do appreciate that it um, it is a topic that staff is willing to talk to us about and just maybe request that we um, we do flag that for a future agenda item because it is becoming as the rep there. It is probably the the biggest thing that I hear about from that school, which I think is a good thing because it means the learning side's going very well, but it would be nice uh, for us to be able to address this before there's another student incident at that school. So I'm, I'm OK with with us parking it for now, but I do want to bring it up and maybe we'll make a formal request for it to be a future agenda item. So. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Higginson. 
Um, I don't see any further questions at this time, so seeing none, we'll move on to item 8.2 on the agenda, which is a school site acquisition update, and there's an information sheet on page 21 of your agenda, and I'll pass it back to Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, just a very brief update uh, to the board as as the board is uh, we made a, was made aware is we have sent uh, letters to our local partners, uh, the very municipalities and regional districts with respect to instituting a school site acquisition charge. Uh, we've had responses back from our partners and have managed to to date meet with Nanaimo, Lady Smith RDN, and of course we'll meet with Lanceville uh, and um, Couch and Valley soon. Um, now where we're at, and again, this is just so the board is aware that this is moving forward. The idea is this, is that uh, we, as we grow and we're starting to see the local, our local partners put out growth predictions that are certainly suggesting, and at least in Nanaimo's case, suggesting such a large growth that we're unlikely to be able to serve um, all of those kids in the current facilities we have, even with portables, in the event that they meet their targets. So certainly they can be optimistic at some time. But what we do by not having a school site acquisition charge is leave money on the table. And so, for instance, in our capital plan last year, Departure Bay was our number one for expansion. When you look at and we were um, in the secretary, uh, Trustee Higginson just brought up traffic issues at a cold North Oyster. Said very similar things are going to continue to occur at Departure Bay potentially. And so, it, are there alternatives? And and one of the ways that we could solve Departure Bay is expanding the land on a currently existing site. Another way that we can address future growth is, for instance, if sandstone ends up being built and built as big as they're um, suggesting they will, we certainly will need an additional site um, to serve the children that grow there. And so what the school site acquisition charge would do would be giving us money every single time a building permit goes in. Um, the cities would, or our partners would hold on to the funds until we're ready to acquire a site. Um, the funds cannot be used to actually build the building. That has to be the ministry or us, but we would be working with our partners if the numbers do support uh, a need for additional acquisition to do exactly that. And so our goal is to time this with the long range facilities plan. We've already reached out to uh, a consultant to assist us with with these because we do need to prove our numbers. So the municipalities and, and partners uh, in the regional districts agree with those numbers. Uh, and we'll be reporting back to the board on a regular basis until we've instituted it. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, so are there any questions in relation to this item? I don't see any, so thank you very much. We'll move on to item 8.3, which is new childcare spaces application. So if you refer to page 22 of your agenda, we have an action sheet uh, and just note that staff are asking for a motion uh, as recommended on uh, on the action sheet. So I'll pass it back to Secretary Treasurer Mark, Mark Walsh for an overview. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the board um, is aware that we were successful in achieving uh, multiple million dollars to expand uh, zero to five and before and after school care at a number of our sites last year. Uh, I'm happy to announce that the work is well underway. Um, the building of some of the sites by our own in-house forces along with our students is proceeding. Uh, Forest Park's looking, uh, looking ready to go. And so what we do want to do though is that we were reminded by the Ministry of Children and Families that uh, they're about to close the next tranche of funding availability. So what we would like to do is get the boards okay to proceed with applying for up to five. And I say up to five because we want to ensure it maybe we would report back to the board, but if we can't find five sites that would be appropriate, five sites that um, can, can support the additional demand, uh, then it may be less and we'd come back to the board. We've noted a couple of sites that uh, have high demand uh, in their areas that we've confirmed at a ground, ground level as well as well sufficient space to be able to expand. So um, that's the next step. I also just wanted to thank Mr. Sabo who has reached out to all of our partners at 
uh, regional districts and municipalities uh, to make sure that they're aware of what we're coming to the board with and to get their sense if there's a location that they know through their work that would be uh, would meet a demand for them. And so we're also not overlapping in our work. So appreciated um, there and we look forward to work with our, our partners. So that is the recommendation is so we can proceed and we would make the application for November. I believe it's beginning of November. I can't remember the exact date, but certainly the this motion would need to be passed by the board uh, in October for us to proceed. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. I see that Trustee O'Neill uh, would be willing to move the motion. I, however, I just want to confirm uh, I see that Trustee Higginson has a question. So is this question, Trustee Higginson, something that you'd uh, need to have before we entertain a motion? Uh, not necessarily, but I'm I would like to ask it before we go into motion. So okay, that we're so not hampered by the formality of the motion questioning process. OK, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I am, um, you know, like the other trustees who have commented, happy uh, and support the recommendation. I'm wondering, though, this is our second go at this. We were so successful last year. Now we'd be up to if we're successful again, I believe it would be 10 child care centers, but whatever the number is a lot. And I'm wondering if our staff has thought about an overall child care strategy. Do we have a strategic planning process or an overall um, vision? for uh, all these child care centers that we would then be applying for and have on ours. Are, are we looking at them being, um, you know, privately fund operated? Are we talking about operating them ourselves now that we have the ability to, like, are we partnering with existing operators? I just wonder if that conversation has happened. Do we have an overall vision for how we would like to have child care on our, uh, within our district? So, through you, Mr. Chair. So we are having those discussions, I guess, on, on an ongoing basis. Uh, and I would say that at this point, it's a bit of a mixture of of all of the points that, that Trustee Higginson brought up. So for instance, with the ones um, that are immediately coming online, um, one of the things we've reached out, particularly given COVID, um, is to the existing um, holders uh, at school, so the existing providers at schools, to see if they would be willing um, to, to take on that service, at least for the time being, to expand. Um, and so that we've definitely had a lot of interest. Another thing that we are doing and planning as we speak is a request for qualification. So that would be to put out um, the idea that particularly with our zero to five uh, care centers, uh, looking for a partner or multiple partners or regional partners, however that would look, um, to provide that service uh, based off of their experience and need. And so that way, of course, we would have um, you know, sophisticated nonprofits would be a requirement uh, to provide those services. And of course, we continue to look at the the option of potentially providing some of the services ourselves. Of course, the difficulty being um, in COVID, uh, the idea of getting that off the ground now is is incredibly difficult. Um, and not to mention the the staffing issues that we would have associated with that in the immediate term. So I think we kind of have a short, medium and long term uh, look and we continue to meet as a group uh, once every month month or so. Uh, right now is the is really facilities time to, to get rolling and and purchasing time to get the request for qualification out. So yes, we we have we have a strategy. I don't think the final look of it is, is settled yet, uh, but certainly there we're excited about the idea of integrating the these kids or these these children as much with our schools as we reasonably can. Uh, Trustee Higginson, do you have a follow up? I do actually. I would just like to say that I think it would be um, seeing how uh, this is becoming more of a regular. Um, occurrence and I, I think I, I personally support the use of uh, these facilities on school grounds but they're growing and it's it's a large number if we're successful and I think it would be good for this to be you know the conversations that you're talking about be brought before the board to show how our strategic plan is guiding the um, the path forward 
on this uh, so that we can be part of that conversation as well and, and determine whether, you know, what, what the board's vision is for this in terms of uh, the operations of the, these, these child care centers on school property. So that's just a, another future agenda item. I'm filling them up today. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Higginson. So uh, we have a motion before us and um, I believe Trustee O'Neill would like to move the motion. Thank you, um, Chair Keller. So I'd like to move that the Business Co Committee recommend that the Board of Education of School District number 68, Nanaimo Ladysmith, direct staff to apply for the Child Care BC New Spaces Fund through the Ministry of Children and Families for funding child care expansion for up to five school sites. Do, and we have a seconder, uh, Trustee Berzovic. Is there any discussion? Hearing, oh, is that somebody typing? I'll just give them a second. No? Well, oh. Um, okay, uh, maybe I'll just go back and ask uh, Trustee O'Neill if you'd like to say anything as the trustee who uh, moved the motion. Um, thank you, Chair Keller, and I, I just I would like to uh, motivate this one a little. I appreciate there's not much discussion on it, but um, this is certainly an issue that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, and I'm I'm happy to see that our district's already done this and that we're looking to uh, move forward and to echo uh, some of the points that Trustee Higginson um, flagged prior to this motion being moved around our ability to uh, strategically plan and and work with uh, partner groups to potentially be leaders in um, the ability to provide quality, accessible, affordable um, daycare, uh, early education supports for our um, future students and the families and um, our local economy. So all around, I see this as a really good uh, thing for us to be looking at. And I'm really happy to see that um, for the most part, uh, we're looking to move forward on this. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee O'Neill. Um, so are there, is there anyone opposed to the motion? If you are opposed, please type in the chat box. Just give a quick sec here. And seeing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Moving on to correspondence from the board meeting. We have none this evening. Um, item 10, unfinished business. Uh, we have an action sheet on the automated or external defibrillators on page 23. And again, uh, we are looking, uh, staff is recommend, making a recommendation for a motion and I'll pass it over to Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you just for to, to briefly uh, start uh, the, the, the board off this evening is that I um, want to thank Mr. Sabo and Mr. Dirksen, who is also, I believe, on the line to answer any questions uh, for the positive discussions about this, this particular issue. So as the board will recall, there was a motion to examine the feasibility um, or, or bring back to a later meeting. Uh, we did, and we suggested that um, that the board may take a look at this again in September, and now here we are in, in October. Uh, and what staff essentially is recommending is that um, currently we already have uh, AEDs in our secondary schools, uh, and so we certainly need to make sure that they're they're up to snuff and we would be replacing them as, as need be. Um, what we don't have is we don't have them in elementary schools and we're not recommending that the the board uh, proceed in that direction um, for uh, a couple of reasons and one one definitely is from a cost perspective and so that is that if there was sufficient funds to support AEDs across the system we are concerned about the ongoing costs but we're also concerned that there may be other areas of health and safety that if that money was available to spend uh, that we would be able to hit um, maybe some more effective uh, health and safety measures. But however, at the secondary level, uh, we've reviewed and we've realized that the level of rentals and the level of high energy sports, the level of staffing particularly, uh, our own staff uh, in typically is larger at our secondary levels as well as older students. And so what we're proposing is that um, that 
the board's position would be or recommending that the board's position be that uh, AEDs are available in secondaries. And then what we would do as staff is we would take this motion away if the board approved it uh, and write uh, an AP uh, that would be on the books. And so we realized that we don't want to be run by a single motion that might be forgotten over time, but rather uh, administrative procedure that guides us in the future. So uh, again, uh, Mr. Sabo and Mr. Dirksen are here to answer any questions. Uh, that you may have, but with the recommendations there for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, we have a question from Trustee Stanley. Thank you. Yeah, I. So I'm um, a bit befuddled by this motion, and and I may just have gotten the information that I was looking for, but I can't tell what this motion does. Um, are we? It, so it appears that we're not doing anything differently, that we already have the ADs in all the secondary schools. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused about why we have a motion to do nothing. So can somebody perhaps uh, help me understand a little bit more? So th through you, Mr. Chair. So the intention essentially is to set a district standard that's board board directed. And so often what we may find is that, you know, at some point there was a staff member or there was a group of people that had some grants available to support the installation of these units. These units are going to expire. They are going to need replacement at times. And so again, what this would do is this would say, okay, this is the board standard. And so this is what staff are going to budget for replacement, budget for training, budget for battery replacement, budget for uh, paddles, et cetera. So for instance, if, and I don't, high school X, um, it's units about to wear down. Right now we'd go to it and say, well, we haven't used it ever. Do we really want to go buy it, buy a new one? No, nah, that's fine. We'll we'll move on from that. And this way would just be setting a district standard. Do you have a follow up, Trustee Stanley? No, I just have a secondary question. If you when when you have time. OK, um, I'm going to go next on the list, if that's OK with the question to Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, so my question is approximately uh, how much does it cost to purchase an AED? Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I could ask Mr. Sabo to respond. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, I don't have my uh, finger on that information. If you give me a few moments, I will uh, I will dig that out and uh, um, come back on screen with that info. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Sabo. I, I don't need the answer right now. Um, I guess I was hoping that we would see a uh, sort of overall district strategy. Um, it's a little bit different than I was thinking, but thank you for the information. Um, and is there anyone else on the list here? Uh, I believe Trustee Stanley had another question. Did you want to go ahead, Trustee Stanley? I do, thank you. So um, from what I understand, uh, for example, Gabriola Elementary has an AED that was funded by the Gabriola uh, Recreational Society. Um, at least according to the Gabriel or Recreation Society's documents. Um, and that seems to make a lot of sense to me because they're on the island. The school building is used a lot um, or has been maybe in outside of COVID times. Um, I'm wondering if we have any other areas um, that the school is really the hub of the community, much like the Gabriel Elementary School is. Um, that we either have an AED or um, it, well, my biases would make sense to have one. But um, so I'm wondering if, if we have any other kind of schools in this district that are, are a function in the way that the Gabriola uh, Elementary School do with regards to community activities. Um, <clears throat> through you, Mr. Chair, I, uh, what I was can say is that we have at least uh, two other schools that do have AEDs and they're associated though with specific needs of individuals within that building uh, and medical support for that. For that. Um, and so I can't speak to whether there are any other um, community center uh, type facilities uh, to, to that effect. And perhaps Mr. Sabo, who's come back online with some costing, perhaps can uh, maybe add further to that comment. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm not aware of a current uh, elementary school with the same geographic sort of situation that Gabriola has. I, I am aware that there were elementary schools at different times, at least two, where we had AEDs recommended by students, doctors, uh, elementary schools. I'm not sure if they're still at those schools in effect. I do have uh, the purchase and installation cost of the units is approximately $2,400 a piece. OK, so I don't see any further questions. Uh, do we have a trustee who's willing to move the motion? OK, sir, we have a comment from Trustee O'Neill. Go ahead, Trustee O'Neill. Uh, thanks, and I mean, I'd be happy to move the motion as well. I just, um, I guess I'm looking at this as, uh, you know, we have we have these devices installed in the school that doesn't seem to be a huge sort of cost to me. The 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 aspect of this that I'm, I guess, by passing this motion or recommendation, what we're going to see is a more um, detailed uh, plan, if you will, um, for uh, just to quote the action sheet, long term stability. Because from what I gather is we have these devices in the schools, we haven't necessarily been using them. And I'll just sort of cut to the to the chase of what one of my concerns is, is that you can have these types of devices, but if you don't have the folks on the ground that have the knowledge um, and ability to run the machines and that the machines aren't adequately uh, checked to ensure that they are going to work in a in a uh, emergency situation. So the, I've I've got all those things sort of running through uh, my mind as I look at this because I think we've heard in previous meetings as well that it's it's not a huge um, huge cost factor, but it is really about the long term sort of having an actual plan in place and making sure that we're committed to the to having these in our schools, having the staff there. Is that fair to summarize? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so we would go away. Um, obviously, we've mentioned that the secondary schools are already served by these machines. What we would do is create an AP that does exactly that. And then what may end up happening or what will end up happening is Mr. Sabo or Mr. Dirksen will come and they'll say, OK, well, I need a thousand dollars added per year to the budget to be able to maintain this. And so that's the those are the two things that would be a result of of this motion. Do you have a follow up, Trustee O'Neill? No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a comment from Trustee Robinson. Uh, thanks very much. I'll even get my picture on. <clears throat> About uh, 15 years ago, a young student at uh, Dover Bay, basketball player, died on the court. Uh, he had a problem with his aortic artery. As many people know, in 1998, I had an artificial aortic artery uh, put into me and gave me another 50 years, they said. Uh, so far, I've had 22 years where my heart is working better than it did as a teenager. Uh, this young man, had we had that device at Dover Bay at the time, um, might well be out there playing hoops with me, maybe not at a high level, but uh, I think it's very important that at least every high school have one of these devices. Thank you, Trustee Robinson. Um, I'm next on the list. A uh, question for Secretary Treasurer Walsh or other staff. Um, in our facilities, what are the first aid requirements for our attendees and do they have AED training and certification? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And perhaps Mr. Sabor, or Mr. Dirksen would be able to assist in response or a combination thereof. Um, uh, through the chair, perhaps I could start and, and Will can uh, jump in. Uh, yes, I believe that the level one first aid does include information on the operation of the AEDs. Yeah, that's 
part of the training. Also, we have at high schools, we have level two. We have two uh, designated first aid attendants at each facility. Thank you. You were breaking up a little bit there, Mr. Dirksen, but I I could kind of understand what you were saying. Was anyone that didn't quite understand Mr. Dirksen that we'd like him to repeat? No. Uh, if you if you could, Mr. Dirksen, can you please say that again? Sorry, I'm having some problems with uh, connectivity, but uh, we have level one attendance at elementary school and we have level two attendants at high schools and at each uh, school we have two designated first aid attendants. So it's just as a quick follow up if I may uh, either Mr. Sapo or Mr. Dirksen. So this so the attendants that we have um, are capable of the ongoing maintenance and operation of the AEDs. Um, per, perhaps I'll uh, start through the chair. Um, as we update the AEDs, the technology gets um, more and more advanced. My understanding is that uh, some of the maintenance requirements are lessened because the AEDs are actually connected to our Wi-Fi system and uh, give us alerts um, when they require maintenance. So that, that helps keep them up to date. I'm also led to believe that some of the AEDs actually provide instructions on their own use to individuals who use them who may not have the training. Thank you very much. And our next question comes from um, Trustee Barron. Yes, thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, I just wanted to quickly comment that um, the student that uh, Trustee Robinson was uh, referring to was a student um, at uh, the high school that I attended. And uh, I uh, I had started at the secondary school after that had occurred. And so um, it's interesting that uh, that was brought up tonight because that was the very first thing that I was thinking about as well when this topic um, came to uh, this meeting because of you know the impact I, I didn't know the student but I remember vividly that student's face because of the picture on the wall and the discussions and and the impact that it had on many of my um, many of the other students uh, that I attended that school with and so I appreciate um, the comment made because of the life-saving um, that these AEDs can provide um, so anyways, there's my little my little moment. I appreciate that was brought up. And and so my my question when I was reading this is I was trying to understand because I do think that um, continuing to support AEDs and the maintenance of and the training of AEDs in secondary schools um, and, and putting it in a motion um, is a great step in the right direction. Uh, you know, as I'm sure all of us would like to see, I would prefer to have AEDs in all schools in our district. They're, all of our schools are used as rentals in the community. There's uh, many people of many ages prior to COVID um, that were coming into our schools um, along with the students and staff that are currently in those buildings. And so I would prefer to see them in all buildings. Um, however, I do appreciate that there's many variables uh, that need to be considered. And so I was trying to understand in the write-up um, that was provided to us, it says that uh, the financial commitment of installation and maintenance of AEDs at all sites would not be as effective as other potential safety investments. And I apologize if this has already been clarified, but I'm wondering if we can be provided with some examples of other safety mechanisms that may provide um, increased level of safety uh, to our students and staff and communities um, than that of AEDs, just so I can understand a little bit more about that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I ask Mr. Dirksen to provide a response?
So it looks like yeah, that's, that's a good going. question. Um, we're, we're looking at. It's uh, really a risk management decision. So when you're looking at the whole gamut of the investments, a lot, but uh, just it, since we're talking about first aid, you could have even more basic first aid training, for example, for more staff. That's an example of where um, money could be invested and maybe have an increased level of safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Dirksen. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the best signal with you right now. Perhaps if you tried to turn your camera off, it might help with your connectivity issues. Um, I could understand what Mr. Dirksen was saying on my end, but is there anyone who missed what he was saying and would like to try it again? Okay, looks like we're okay. Um, Trustee Barron, did you have a follow-up to your question? Uh, I guess maybe since you heard uh, the comment maybe a little bit more clearly than I did, uh, Chair, just to clarify, was the response that there is uh, more that more basic first aid training and increased staff could be provided uh, with funds, which um, would be more effective than that of AEDs in elementary schools, is just to clarify. Ms. Trustee Barron, I don't want to put words in Mr. Dirksen's mouth, yeah. but perhaps uh, else heard, Mr. Yeah. Walsh or, or, or perhaps Mr. Dirksen, if he can come back again, could help clarify. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, that you've captured what Mr. Dirksen said. There's other there's other items that over time certainly would be large investments, like we've talked about Solaire's ventilation and Lady Smith Intermediate's ventilation. There's others other issues like that that are are immediate as well. And so we just wanted to to make sure that if if the board say they had eighty thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars to spend uh, on a pure safety issue, what we would probably do is come back with a, a list of items that would range that would be above AEDs in in every in every facility, uh, just because of as Mr. Dirksen mentioned, uh, you know due to limited resources generally we do play a risk management. Uh, lens on on whenever we're doing safety expenditures, and so that that's the thinking behind that. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Seeing none, there is a motion that's been proposed. Do we have anyone who's willing to move the motion? Trustee Barron, would you like to go ahead and move the motion? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, the motion is that the business Committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District Number 68, Nanaimo Lady Smith, direct staff to ensure there is an automated external defibrillator at all secondary school sites. And that motion has been seconded by Trustee Stanley. Is there any discussion? Uh, I would like to, um, I'm next on the list here, just uh, in terms of um, my thoughts, uh, I would too like to see them eventually be included in all of our schools. I, I appreciate the, the motion and will be supporting the motion that is presented before us. Um, it would be great if uh, over time we could extend the program throughout the district. Are there any other questions or discussion? Okay. I see that Trustee Stanley has a comment. I do. I just uh, wanted to take the opportunity. I mean, my support of this motion is uh, because I don't want to cut to my nose off and spike my face. Um, I am, you know, I guess I'm disappointed in this motion because, yes, on one hand, there are costs. Um, and on the other hand, or the consideration is that, you know, they're not used uh, often um, or have been. Uh, but in the very extreme circumstances and that are unusual um, in which they are required, it is a, often a life or death situation, which are, are rare, but extreme. And so I do see the, <clears throat> you know, cautiousness of having them in our schools to protect not only students, but our staff, 
um, and community members in our schools. So, I mean, I support this motion because it's better than nothing. Um, but I would uh, like just to support Trustee Chair, Chair Keller's comments um, that you know, going forward, if we could, you know, consider perhaps an incremental plan about how to increase them in our schools, um, you know, once our schools are active again in our communities, um, I think that that is something that um, is is important for future consideration, given that, relatively speaking, this isn't a huge cost. Thank you, Trustee Stanley. <clears throat> is there any other further comments or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. Is there anybody opposed to the motion? Just give everyone a quick moment here. And seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Okay, so we are moving on to item 10.2, <coughs> which is our accessibility audit. Um, you'll note that page 24 of the agenda includes an information sheet for your consideration. So I'll pass it over to Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, this is just a brief update. Uh, so the board may recall the discussion around um, the report that staff brought back last spring with, re with respect to accessibility audit. There was no specific uh, motion that uh, resulted from that. Uh, but the discussion of the board was for staff to, to essentially go have another a look and talk to members of the community and come back to the board and give a bit of a report. Given COVID, however, and given the nature of the discussion, we certainly want to involve um, external partners that are in the community in this discussion before we come back with any uh, potential future um, recommendation to the board to proceed. And so given COVID, um, given to a certain extent the busyness, but given our tr attempt to limit access to our schools. We actually haven't taken that step yet. Um, so we will be in the in the near future doing that. But what we didn't want to do is um, not give the board an update exactly where we were and the reasons um, why this hasn't progressed further. Um, so we just wanted to give the board a brief update where we're at and what we would be intending to do. And I, we don't need a motion would be to come back in spring um, with a little bit more fulsome report as well as the feedback we've received from uh, accessibility advocates in the community. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Are there, do any trustees have questions? I see that Chair McKay has a comment. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not going to turn my camera on because of um, connectivity issues. I guess what my comment is that I would like to perhaps see one area looked at prior to the spring of 2021 and that would be accessibility into the board office via the boardroom um i'm just going to throw it out there for thought but i'd like i'd like to see if we can get some kind of particular cost around what it would take to create access from the boardroom through into the upper level of our um, district administration center um, if that could be prioritized for consideration, I think that that's important given um, given the makeup of our board and allowing access for all trustees into our main administration building. Thank you, Trustee McCade. Were um, you looking for a response to that comment or question? I'm fine either way. <laughs> I see that. Uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh put his hand up. Did you want to respond? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we we would be happy to take that that step without without a motion. To we're regularly getting kind of individual uh, quotes on various projects, and so that would be um, that would not be a concern for us to get in advance. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions on this item? Trustee Stanley. Um, so I admit I was a bit confused by the documents. No, just noting now that the next appendix A is actually previous um, from May. Um, so I'm. I don't like this. Um, I don't like this because 
I don't think this is something um, that is is fair. Um, I, you know, I, I I think there's a difference between um, you know going through and doing our own accessibility audit where we fulfill a, or look through a checklist um, versus you know coming from a place of experience and knowledge. And I know we're stalling on this in some ways, given COVID and whatnot. But I, I just, I have a hard time delaying because I think that when we react to, um, as we, as our current situation is, what we do is we react to situations of inequity. Um, but that doesn't create equity. Um, and so, what it fundamentally does is it. It, it we're we're acting now as our current situation is that we're acting we're providing band-aids um to situations without addressing the issue and at policy from a policy perspective we don't you know only re, we don't only react to situations for example of sexism we have um we've taken steps to provide a sexism free workplace um and learning environment um we have th you know policies that prohibit discrimination and harassment and because we understand that such issues of inequity uh, of those are barriers to success. And so well, I relate this to students <clears throat> and I think about like, you know, we don't say success for some, we say success for all. And in order for us to truly work towards achieving um, equal access to success, for us to really look, you know, to work for that catchphrase that we think is, you know, is so incredibly important. I really think that we need to be proactive in removing barriers to success. And I hear that we're busy. I hear there's some concerns, but I, I think that this is something that should be proactively considered and prioritized. And, and I guess I ask if it can be something that we can further consider as part of our long range facilities plan, um, if it can be a conversation that occurs um, through that process somehow. Thank you, Trustee Stanley. Uh, that was a question, I believe, at the end. So um, if uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh or other staff could respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With respect to the Long Range Facilities Plan, it actually is the intention of staff to bring an accessibility aspect to the LRFP. Um, so to that part of the question, I can say that that is the intention to come back with that as a as part of recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, did you have a follow up to your question? I do. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Um, so then I guess through the chair. Uh, we we're planning to have this conversation during the long range facilities, so we're, we're going to consider this very soon is what I just heard. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, the, I think the intention would be uh, yes, but the final plan of whatever accessibility would look like wouldn't be complete until we have those conversations at the later time. So the intention would not be to hire a consultant in the next month month's time to create an accessibility plan that's fully integrated into the long range facilities plan. There'd be ac aspects of accessibility um, that would be recommended if the board so deems it necessary or wants it uh, with respect to how accessibility is going to be integrated into the long range facilities plan in a broader, I guess you would say almost policy framework, and then the work would get done at a later time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Our next question comes from Trustee Barron. Thank you through the chair. Uh, I, I'm hesitating because I have so many questions in my mind that I can't even seem to figure out which one is most important and they're not all connected. It's always dangerous for me to speak when I'm not connecting the pieces quite yet, but I am, I guess what happened for me is that when reading the agenda, we had um, information sheets that were brought forward that were dated for today. And so I too was confused as to the fact that this information sheet was, and it clearly states on there, so this is on me, the date on there that this is an information sheet from May and not an information sheet that has been updated and has been provided 
and that is being provided to us as a board, uh, similar to the previous information sheet sheets before. So just to, to clarify that, that this information sheet is an old information sheet with old information that is being brought forward in order for an update to be provided to the board around what's being done. Could I confirm that piece, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So yes, so the discussion that occurred um, with respect to the administration's uh, to staff's recommendation last spring that we do have included here and it's included here for just for context uh, was uh, verbally, I mean, the board gave direction, please come back in, in fall after having some further discussions with the community um, in fall. And so this is that update right now to make sure that we're providing the board, um, well, exactly what it, it requested. And so again, um, we're, we're suggesting that the a further report come back in spring to give time for those further conversations to happen. Of course, if the board directs a different direction, we will go a different direction. Uh, Trustee Barron, did you have a follow up? Yes, thank you. So to clarify, there was no official motion that was brought forward by the board to do this work. This was uh, a topic that came up and a recommendation by the board that was agreed upon by the board. I'm, I apologize, I'm trying to understand so that I can properly ask my question. So, so through you, Mr. Chair, so typically what would have happened is, is that a motion would have, would have been moved and passed or moved and defeated. And I believe that the motion just wasn't moved. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember, but with 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 the direction by the board, not through a motion that staff would come back um, in in fall for further discussion. If Thank I you. Oh, OK, I'll allow one more. Thank Our you, trustee. Chair. Just trying to understand the context of the information being brought forward to us. Um, so. <sighs> See, I could ask another clarifying question again, but um, uh, what I'm trying to understand then is that uh, the board suggested uh, that information around an external consultant uh, and what that might look like and the costs uh, be provided for the board to be able to make a decision around how they would like to move forward around understanding the accessibility of our buildings in this district in the process of the long range facilities. And I guess my question is, 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 is what's being brought forward to us today by staff um, suggesting that the board wait on this information until we've completed our long range facilities? Um, I, if you can clarify, please, the process that is being recommended to um, the board and if you could clarify how that would impact our ability to effectively um, complete our long range facilities planning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the, the, the recommendation that the that staff provided in the spring was do, that not recommending to use an external provider for the purposes of, of the accessibility audit. Um, and we're concerned about costs, but we're also concerned about just the ability on an ongoing basis to maintain and address the various issues. Um, and we were suggesting that if it was done in house, that there'd be more ownership, that we'd be able to, you know, plan, you know, multiple different plans uh, to be to be part of that accessibility project over the years. And then, as I recall, the discussion of the board was, OK, well, we still think it's really important that staff um, go and get some perspective from individuals that have the lived experience, and it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, an external consultant that would do that work. And so rather than try to bring external folks into our buildings um, during the COVID time, that that's where the the delay has occurred with respect to having those conversations. So those are the the intent the tenant conversations. Um, with respect to having an accessibility plan that's fully incorporated into the long range facilities plan, um, that wasn't what we were recommending. Like you know, school X should be tomorrow. School Y should be three weeks from now. School Z should be three years from now. That's that wasn't what we we're recommending. Um, 
So I hope that gives a little bit of context. It's for us to be able to go out and, and talk to some local folks with lived experience to say, how are we going to approach this to be able to report back to the board the feedback from those individuals to give a better concept if we're able to do that with the help of those folks or the, ultimately the board's going to want to proceed uh, to hire an external organization. Thanks, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, our next on the list is Trustee Higginson. Thank you to the chair. I just want to say that I actually think that this um, recommendation lines up well with uh, the current place that the legislation sits. We were waiting in the spring. There was supposed to be the unveiling of the new BC um, accessibility legislation, but it got delayed because of COVID, I believe. And obviously now it's further delayed because of the election. And it would be easier for us to conduct this study under the umbrella of the new legislation anyway. So this actually lines up well with the provincial level of um, guidance that, that we are going to be having to work under. And I, I think um, while I do hear concerns about with from my fellow trustees about how this lines up with our long range facilities plan. It's also important for us all to remember that accessibility is not just about facilities. That's just a very small part of it. This is also about employing, you know, being a good employer, um, all sorts of um, other barriers um, that fall under accessibility. So I think that um, we will manage um, the long range facilities plan appropriately and, and can also think about the larger aspect of accessibility um, that we need to once the, the legislation comes out as well. I think that will help guide our work. Thank you. Thanks, Trustee Higginson. Um, moving on to Trustee O'Neill. Um, thank you. I just, I think I, a lot of my, thank you uh, through the chair to the um, Secretary Treasurer. Um, in your prior comments, you helped clarify and answer a few of the questions that I had. Um, and I also appreciate um, the reference to the timing with what was um, being done provincially and how we can align ourselves there. I look at this um, information sheet and um, I see this as a measured and appropriate sort of course of action moving forward. And I appreciate this appendix, appendix as sort of a, a reference document, if you will, on how we can start this process internally. And I don't see it as something that would eliminate our opportunity to expand outward um, and certainly lean on folks that are experts in the field um, that can provide that um, arm's reach um, length um, of what you know we we may not be seen internally um, so that's my sort of blanket comments and I'm going to look uh, quick <laughs> I just can't help myself here um, I see and I know that this is just an example but um, one of the things on this Bayview example here has it it's noted that has a, a knob not a lever now I lived in uh, I lived in uh, Lower Mainland for quite some time and I recall that there was a bylaw that um, a building code bylaw that changed that you couldn't have uh, knobs and you had to have levers. So this sort of uh, piqued my curiosity as if we have a similar uh, code here. And uh, if so, what would be our requirement to go about uh, doing those types of changes? And I, I know I've gone sort of off on a tangent here and you may not have the answer to that, but um, for for accessibility reasons is why that um, that bylaw and that code was changed. So I was just a little curious on that. Thanks. I'm not sure, uh, Trustee O'Neill, if that was a question that staff could uh, respond to or not. Um, Mr. Sabo, perhaps do you have a comment that you'd like to add? Uh, through the chair, yes. Um, Building code often changes, um, has many times over the lifespan of our buildings. And in some cases we um, do voluntary upgrades to meet the code or the ministry will fund us for voluntary upgrades. In other cases, we upgrade at various times when we're doing alterations or when we're doing significant capital upgrades. So um, in this case, we may find uh, when doing accessibility upgrades that it's something that we want to change to support the program that we have in front of us. 
rather than wait until we're doing a significant renovation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. And did you have a follow up, Trustee O'Neill? No, thank you. That was uh, the answer I was hoping to hear. Great question. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next on our list is Trustee Barron. Oh, thank you. Um, through the chair, I appreciate all the information and um, the I'd be interested to learn more about the timeline around the legislation changes. So that's good information for us to know. I, I do agree that it is best for us to align, of course, um, with any legislation that is changing around uh, the accessibility um, of our schools. I what I was trying to understand is, uh, you know, I, is there any work that could be done? Um, prior to knowing more about the legislation that could put us in a position where we are being um, a little bit, um, I shouldn't say a little bit more, but proactive period um, in this work. I think about, you know, so many of the benefits that may, uh, depending on the costs, of course, which I know it says that it's up to 40,000, that there's a range um, so I don't know a lot of information to be able to go off right now. So I just have many questions around um, any potential cost savings that may come from us understanding more from an external um, auditor and also, you know, have some concerns around how um, if we are reacting to specific student and staff needs in the buildings, um, you know, whether that is the most cost efficient way and also um, some problems in my mind around access uh, as a whole for the community if we're just reacting to specific needs. So I, I just have many questions and would love the opportunity to dig a little deeper um, into the options of what uh, an external auditor would be able to bring to the table um, and then could build on the great work that's happening in the district already. And so, um, you know, I'd be happy to continue on um, with the staff recommendation and and then uh, wait to hear back um, when appropriate more information. But I, I guess my only hesitancy is I would prefer to not um, to just to ensure that we do have further discussion around uh, the benefits and potential drawbacks of having an external auditor coming in to assess our our current status. Yeah, so just more of a comment. I'm realizing now that no question came out of that. My apologies. That was a comment. Thank you very much, Chair. Right. Thank you, Trustee Barron. Um, moving on uh, to Trustee Brzezik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thought I had a question too, but now I've lost it. I just was going to, one of the things I want, oh, I think I got it. Um, one of the things that, w when I first brought this up, one of the things that triggered it for me was that I had attended an event with uh, our MLA Malcolmson and a whole group of people put on by the BC Spinal Cord uh, Association and they were talking about the legislation as Trustee Higginson referenced and my concern was I wanted us to be prepared for that leg legislation in case the legislation came through and was passed and there was a demand that we start doing certain things fairly quickly. So my question I guess would be to Mr. Sabo, uh, when building codes change, do they do does the I can't think of the name of the group that would the people the building code people do they give you a time limit where you have to be be caught up to the code or pardon yeah so I'm just trying to understand like if say some building codes changed and we would find that some of our buildings weren't in compliance would we have how much time would we have to catch up Through the, through the chair. Um, from time to time, uh, the local authorities uh, will have a health and safety item that they want the district to uh, upgrade and they work with us to uh, understanding that we have funding mechanisms. So for example, the uh, city of Nanaimo is currently working with us on uh, backflow preventers being installed in all of our schools to protect the water supply. So we're working with the Ministry of Education and that's not something they're they're uh, they're hoping to wait for us to apply for a building permit. 
but they are every time we apply for a building permit, they're asking us to do the cross connect. Um, typically, um, we have the ability to either sell, uh, either decide we're going to upgrade ourselves uh, in a voluntary program or wait until there's a um, there's a building permit pulled and the local authority requires or good practice requires us to upgrade the code. We do it. Uh, sorry, I should just add we do a significant amount of voluntary upgrading uh, through our uh, AFG program. Excellent. Yeah. If I could just have a follow up comment, Mr. Chair. Yes, please go ahead. I just want to say that as a person who is disabled and who's been sitting here listening tonight more than speaking, that I appreciate the depth of comments and questions and discussion we're having here because the only way we are really going to truly make progress on true integration and inclusion is if people for whom it isn't a problem also take an interest and in, and a willingness to advocate to say hey this needs to be addressed so even if we I, i'm comfortable with holding off on doing anything external right now i would i think it's important that we not lose the conversation i and this is just a suggestion I'm throwing out and I'm not. It might be worthwhile for us to have a work session as a board to talk about this or in, as we say, we're going to be talking about our long range facilities plan. So I, I think as a board, this is something we need to discuss further. What our intentions and our goals are around this and I want to say publicly to Trustee McKay, I appreciated your comments around the access to the admin level of the building because that has been something that I admit has been on my mind for a number of years. So thank you for that and I, I, I can support what staff is suggesting at this point as long as we don't lose momentum and let it fall to the wayside again as has been as can happen with these sorts of issues. Thank you trustee Berzovic. Um, so I just want to confirm with uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh that there is no motion associated or recommendation associated with this item. This was for information. That's correct, Chair. Thank you very much. So is there any other questions from trustees or our stakeholders related to this item? Hearing none, we'll move on to the Item number 11. Um, so what we have is uh, a recommendation to adopt our environmental stewardship policy and two recommendations uh, to receive and go to notification on a policy development policy and a public participation policy. And trustees and others will note that there is an action sheet on page 30 of your agenda. And I'll hand this off to Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and so um, I am going to happily hand this off to, I'm not sure if it's Chair McKay or Trustee Stanley to perhaps uh, review uh, the environmental stewardship policy. If we could pass this to Trustee Stanley, I think that would be appropriate. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I can't help be really excited about this. Um, so this has been a journey and uh, I don't think we need, I need to motivate this anymore. Um, I, I really just want to um, explain a little bit about the final document that you have in front of you, albeit the formatting is going to be uh, slightly different. Um, and I'm not sure if Ms. Matthews wants to bring the, oh look, she's on it. Um, so this is the, the the formatting has simply been changed for readability and cohesion. Um, what has happened is when we went out to the community uh, for consultation, uh, we received um, really thoughtful and thought provoking feedback and that had a significant influence on this document. Um, that I think fundamentally in a sense offered it didn't change the document profoundly um, or the spirit of the document profoundly, but what it did is it prioritized a few things that I think that it was really great that we received that guidance to have that be prioritized. So I'll highlight what those are. In the first paragraph, um, what has been moved around to be our first statement 
is the idea that the land is an important source of knowledge. Um, and that was in the document elsewhere. And um, it's been moved to the front as per the, the recommendation from our community members. And I think that I was a, a frankly, you know, I, I have uh, it's a beautiful recommendation in the sense that it prioritizes, um, you know, what it consistent with the CSS policy, how it is that we understand the value, um, what I don't have words for it. I feel maybe English is not good for this. Um, the value of what does the land mean to us? What is it in our lives? How does it, you know, this thing that sustains us and is so con we're so connected to um, to have it prioritized was uh, subtle yet profound in some ways. <clears throat> the rest um, sections, um, the next paragraph talked about the interconnectedness, but a, the word holism was added as per the recommendations or a consultation again to notion the ocean that beyond interconnectedness that we when we are interconnected that our interconnection is greater than the sum of our parts. So the whole, our world, our you know ecosystem is not just the sum of the parts. Um, it's that interconnection that that creates you know our earth and in, in a more profound way than simply a you know like a machinery pieces. Um, the final piece that I'll get to is um, the word restoration, and um, we incorporated this notion. Um, in a bit different way, and so this would be the third paragraph, in a bit of a different way than was recommended, but I think the fact that the, the, the idea that restoration was brought forward as a guiding principle was another a great suggestion. Um, and so we added it in, um, in a philosophical way as a guiding uh, principle. So it says, guided by the notions of reciprocity, responsibility, and restoration, um, the Nanaimo Lady Smith Board of Education commits to being an active part of the solution to the current climate crisis and to ongoing environmental stewardship by, and then we list our action pieces. So I think that those are the changes um, that were a result of really spending some time with the feedback that we received and I'm happy to answer any, any questions if people are interested. I believe that we've all come to um, um, value this document, I hope. And I really will finally say that I, I, I profoundly believe that this is so incredibly interconnected to our CSS policy that they are, um, uh, you can't see this, but my hands here, my hands are held together as I'm speaking and as, as I realize that, that that's what they are. They are absolutely interconnected and uh, entirely um, uh, one in many ways. So I'm glad that we have um, this coming forward to us at this time. I'll stop there. Thank you, Trustee Stanley. Um, so are there any questions or comments before we entertain the motion? Hearing none, Trustee Stanley, did you want to move the motion? I would be um, happy to. I just have to pull it up here. Um, so that the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School Districts number 68, and I'm a Lady Smith, adopt uh, environmental stewardship as policy 1.5. Thank you, Trustee Stanley. And we have Trustee Berzovic who has seconded the motion. Any discussion? Hearing none, is there anybody opposed to the motion? <coughs> Seeing nobody opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on. Uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh, if you want to continue on with uh, the discussion related to policy 2.7 and 2.17. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I think that this one would um, likely be best addressed by uh, Chair McKay. If Thank you. Reception in Hammond Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think what I'm going to do with this one is I'll just give you a quick preamble and then I'll move the first recommendation. And so the first policy that we're bringing to the board tonight as a policy committee is the policy 2.7 on policy development. 
Um, this was previously reviewed in the fall of last year, and we received feedback from trustees and the business committee. And at the time we went back and we made those recommended changes by many of our trustees. And we also asked ourselves the question, um, how do we look at this policy and policy development in the future through the CIA ITSIS lens? And that brought us through um, a very thoughtful discussion that took us quite some time to get through and learn from. And essentially we came to the conclusion that each individual trustee and all everyone who's involved in policy work should consider um, the CA ITSIS policy and all of the work that they do. And so each of us is going to have a different journey related to the CA ITSIS framework. And we ask that you consider that um, when considering the policy development policy. And, and that would be said also of the following policy that we'll be talking about public participation. Um, and so what I'll do at this point in time is I'll move that the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District number 68, Nanaima Lady Smith, receive the draft updated policy 2.7 policy development and circulate as a notice of motion for 30 days, utilizing the consultation process as per board governance section 1, 2.7 policy development. Thank you, Chair McKay. Moved by Chair McKay, do we have a seconder? Seconded by Trustee O'Neill. Is there any discussion? Let's give it a second here. Seeing none, is there anybody opposed to the motion? Just type in the chat box if you are opposed. Seeing none, the motion is approved unanimously. And if we could move on to Draft policy 2.17. I'll pass it back to, I understand, Chair McKay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the business, or, uh, before I read the motion, I just want to acknowledge um, the participation with the policy committee um, of Trustee Keller, as well as Director of Communications, Dale Burgos. They both participated and added their expertise to the development of this new policy, which is going to be hopefully a new policy that we're able to adopt and implement after we go to um, 30 day motion. So all of um, the feedback that we received was implemented here. A little bit of reworking and finalizing before we're bringing it back to the board. Um, and with that, I'd like to move that the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District number 68, and I'm a Lady Smith, receive the draft policy 2.17 public participation and circulate as a notice of motion for 30 days utilizing the consultation process as per board governance section 1 2.7 policy development. Moved by Chair McKay, seconded by Trustee Stanley. Is there any discussion? Uh, I guess I should have asked you the last motion, but that's okay. Chair McKay, did you have anything further to add? Um, only to say that I think what we've done here is is talked about public engagement in a new sort of fashion. I think typically what we've done is talked about community engagement in relation to projects that um, sort of connect to our facilities. And I think that this actually is going to provide us with a process to understand what we're asking of who, um, whether we inform, consult or um, do the other steps that are available in the chart and we're using international standards here, which I think is a benefit to the board is, is being able to follow those standards allows us to to have that a professional integrity built into our policy. So I think I'll leave it with that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So the motion has been seconded. Uh, we have a comment from Trustee Brzevich. I just want to say I wholeheartedly support this recommendation and really, really want to just commend the, the policy committee for the excellent work that you've done on all of the policies that we're bringing forward tonight. Thank you, Trustee Bursevic. Is there any other questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. Is there anybody opposed to the motion? Again, if you are, type it in the chat box, please. Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item number 12 for information. There's nothing on the agenda tonight. Uh, Item number 13, Ms. Matthews, do we have any questions? Uh, 
no questions uh, this evening. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Trustee Stanley and seconded by, oh boy, all of you are coming to me at the same time here. Uh, I believe Trustee Barron. And I believe that's, uh, do we need to, do we need a vote on that? No, thank you. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.